Good morning, everyone. Good morning to you all, to you all here in this physical sanctuary. Good morning to those of you joining us in our Zoom sanctuary. Good morning to everyone here at the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. We are a loving community of seekers striving to live with integrity, nurture wonder, and inspire the actions that transform us and transform the world. I'm the Reverend Julia Hamilton, and I'm so glad that you've taken time out of this busy world to be here together and nurture our spirits here together this morning. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors, friends, and family we have joining us here or online. We would love to get to know you better, so if you want to stop by the welcome table after the service or fill out our online connection card or that yellow connection card that's in the printed order of service here, that'll let us keep in touch with you and connect you to what's going on in the life of this congregation. And this Sunday, on the second Sunday of every month, we have a newcomer orientation in the front office, which is just right across that courtyard there. Uh, if you want to stop in and say hello, maybe meet a couple of other new folks, find out more about us, ask any questions you like. It's a very casual, a short introduction to this congregation. But if you're ready to dive a little deeper, I have an opportunity for you this Thursday. We have a path to membership class. This is a chance to gather over a light dinner uh, at 6 o'clock on Thursday evening, learn a little bit about Unitarian Universalist history, uh, ask questions, meet each other, and find out what it means to be a part of this congregation. So if you think that this congregation just might be your home, uh, I encourage you to RSVP for that path to membership class coming up on Thursday. And if you are at home in this faith we call Unitarian Universalism, I have another opportunity, which is that this Saturday on the 20th, the candidate for the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association will be with us here live and in person at the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara, which is fantastic. Yes, it's worth cheering about. Um, this is her only West Coast stop before the election at General Assembly this year, but you do need to RSVP. Um, so there is a link in your email, there's information in your order of service, but we would love to have a great turnout and there'll be a reception afterwards hosted by the Alliance. So a lot of gratitude for them for helping step up to make this event happen. And it is, of course, our movement towards June, the end of our congregational year and our annual meeting on June 4th. But rather than highlighting our annual meeting, I also want to highlight that that is our flower celebration. That is the day we ask people to bring flowers into service on Sunday morning on June 4th. So just tuck that in the back of your head. You'll be getting more information. But start uh, looking at your garden and, with permission, your neighbor's garden. <laughs> no poaching flowers without consent, of course. I invite you now to take a breath, to settle yourself wherever you are to allow yourself to fully arrive and be here in this hour together as I let the sound of our bell connect us. As we light our chalice this morning, if you are participating from home, type chalice is lit in the chat box and add your street name. The light of life shines through each and every person. The light of truth shines through each life. May the light of this flame remind us that our search for light and truth is ongoing and renewed by every person we meet. May we know the light in each other. Here on my left is an opportunity for anyone to write down hopeful things that they have seen or experienced, which can then be placed in our change jar. My contribution is a shout out to Dignity Moves the Bay Area-based organization responsible for the tiny housing village at 216 
Santa Barbara Street, just down, just a few blocks down, where people are treated with dignity and given a private dwelling, hope for the future, and a safe place to get their lives together. Visit the Dignity Moves website, take a tour, see what plans are in store for Santa Barbara, and find out what the residents themselves have to say about the meaning of home. Let us go ahead and sing together this morning. This is an easy one to find in the gray hymnal. It's, it's number one, right? Right there in the front. But we also have the words on your screen so you can sing along with us. May nothing evil cross this door. carpets or floors to come up and join and join us for a time for all ages welcome welcome everyone um, the story I'm going to tell uh, today is an adaptation a liberal adaptation of um, a folk tale from the Philippines and it's called the parts of the house argue and I believe is there a photo coming up there's a slide you'll want to keep your eye out for up there Stobo Sa is a small neighborhood situated in La Trinidad, Banguet, in the Philippines. Stobo Sa used to be a collection of small, shabby homes perched on a green hill. But in 2016, the Tam Awan Arts Village Group repaired and painted all of the houses in bright yellows, reds, greens, and blues connecting colorful patterns of sunflowers and other shapes from house to house. When viewed from a distance, the neighborhood of Stobosa looks like one giant work of art. One of the houses in Stobosa was being fixed up for the grandson of an elder of the neighborhood. Esteban had been away for several years, but wanted to move home with his husband Juan and their two children. Elise and Gregorio, to live in this beautiful hillside village near his grandmother. One afternoon, as the construction workers were working on the house, a strange thing happened. 
the parts of the house began to argue with each other. The poles that supported the house on the hillside started grumbling and one said, I am the most important part of this house because I was driven into the earth first. The rest of the poles replied, we're just as important as you are. Without all of us, the house would tumble down the hillside. As the poles quarreled about their relative importance, the floor supports shouted, no one would care about the poles if we were not here to connect you. Upon hearing that, the crossbeams cried out, without us, you would all wobble and sag. <laughs> Listen, the floorboards replied. Without a floor, neither of you would have a reason to exist. The walls chimed in hastily. Who would walk? Who would want to walk on you without us to create rooms? With that, the roof bellowed. I protect all of you from the rain and harsh sun. Without me, you would all rot. Seeing that nothing good could come of this argument, one of the builders raised her hammer to silence the house. Quietly, she said, none of you is important without the other, and all of you are important in making this a safe, safe and sturdy house for Esteban and Juan and their children. The parts of the house mumbled their apologies to each other and began working together to prepare the house for the family. About a week later, Esteban, Juan, and the children arrived in Stobosa, where they were met by Esteban's grandmother. As they slowly drove up the hill to their beautiful orange, green, and yellow home, nestled among the other colorful homes, they marveled at how beautiful it was. This house is so bright and cheerful, said Esteban, but I hope the kitchen is well appointed. The kitchen is the most important room in the house. It is where we are nourished every day. Juan, who was exhausted from packing and moving, replied, I hope the bedrooms are cool and quiet. The bedrooms are the most important room in the house because they are where we rest and rejuvenate. The teenage daughter Felice rolled her eyes. All parents care about is getting enough sleep and eating enough vegetables. The bathroom is the most important room in the house because that is where we bathe and make ourselves look nice for the world. Baths, yuck, said her younger brother, Gregorio. The living room is the most important room in the house. That is where we play games and read stories and build blanket forts. Seeing that nothing good could come of this argument, Esteban's grandmother shushed everyone and said, all of these things, nourishment, rest, self-care, play, and of course love are what make a house a home. But you are forgetting one thing. What is that, grandmother, Esteban asked. Look up the hill at our beautiful, colorful neighborhood. Do you see how the yellow flower painted on your front door extends to my house next door? And the blue circle on my house is completed on my neighbor's roof? The family nodded. And remember, it is your neighbors who have been repairing your house and making it ready for you. The family nodded again. Grandmother smiled as she looked at the bright, colorful houses on the hillside. A home, she said is not complete without the love and care of a community. My home, your home, all of our neighbors' homes, alone, they are a bunch of houses. Together, we are one big, beautiful work of art. And that is our time for all ages. <laughs>
This morning we're talking about house and home, but of course it's also another holiday. It is Mother's Day. And so we're going to take time now to let us mark how beautiful and complex our relationship to motherhood can be. Each of us exists because someone mothered us in one way or another. And our relationship with mothering contains the potential for both some of the most meaningful and some of the most painful experiences of our lives. The stories and experiences of our relationship to motherhood are as diverse as the people in this room. So as a congregation, we want to make space for all of our stories, to expand our compassion to include all of the joys and all of the sorrows that come with being beautifully and perfectly human, raised by other people who are also beautifully and imperfectly human. This can be a day of joy, and for many it can be a difficult day. And here in this sanctuary, there is room for all of it. So I'm going to invite Peter to help me out with a blessing this morning. And as we begin, I invite you to settle into a comfortable posture, maybe breathe into that space of open-hearted acceptance of yourself and one another. Maybe you want to put your hand over your heart or hold your hands open in your lap. Or if you're sitting nearby someone and you have permission, you might want to hold hands with them. You can close your eyes if you want. You can soften your gaze or focus on the flame of the chalice or the sounds of the room. And although most mothers are women, motherhood and mothering can be done by people of diverse genders. And so we offer you these blessings. To all those who have lovingly mothered others in your beautiful diversity, we bless you. To those who experience pain at the marking of this day, we witness with you and bless you. To those who are in the thick of raising and nurturing children of any age, we see your hard work and we bless you. To those who have made the decision not to conceive or bear children, we honor your path and we bless you. To those whose experience of motherhood is intertwined with estrangement, loss, or alienation, we make space for your grief, and we bless you. To those who mourn their mothers and mother figures who have gone from this life to join the ancestors, we remember with you, and we bless you. To those who have encountered violence where there should have been tenderness and care, who have endured abuse by the person mothering them, we hold hope for your healing, and we bless you. To those who carry guilt or shame about being a not good enough mother or are working towards repair and healing, we support you and we bless you. To those who have experienced the pain of infertility, miscarriage, and stillbirth, and whose stories are too often held in silence, we see you and we bless you. To those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you and we bless you. To those who have embraced non-traditional parenting and family structures, who have thrown open their hearts to children in need of love and have fought for the recognition and the right to mother, we bless you. To those who are single moms, grandmoms, stepmoms, foster moms, adoptive moms, mentor moms, birth moms, and spiritual moms. We cherish you and we bless you. And to those whose story of motherhood is still being written, whose agency and self-determination are under attack and whose rights are being stripped from them, we will defend your right to make your own decision about your own reproductive choices. We will fight with you to preserve your freedom and dignity and we bless you. Let us bless all of our stories of motherhood today. We are a community strong enough, brave enough, and loving enough to hold the diversity among us with tenderness and care. And may we be reminded here that we do not travel alone, but are carried in a river of compassion 
with companions who see us, love us, help us heal, celebrate, and grow, and bless us so that we may all survive and thrive together. May it be so. Since I practice architecture and interior design, Reverend Julia asked uh, if I had any thoughts about what makes a house a home. What are the necessary ingredients? I've found that there are only two ingredients, and I learned what they are from working with people, some of whom I see here this morning. One ingredient is internal, what we bring to our own perception of the world and our place in it. The other is external, what needs to be provided or obtained. Neither are physical things, but we know them when they're present and when they're not. When people are engaged in changing their residence Invariably, they want the same things. More efficiency, a healthy environment, intimacy, and beauty. These are all facets of an improved quality of life. But these things alone do not make a house, or one of my least favorite expressions, a living unit, into a home. To transform a dwelling into a home takes gratitude. The internal process of giving thanks for what you have. Home is the place you are grateful to be. And by that definition, any kind of dwelling will qualify. I have worked with people who lived in their garages one person who inhabited a tool shed. I've worked with people living in condos, apartments, and individual residences, small and large, and I have never seen any qualifying physical measure for what constitutes a home, except having gratitude for it. I've worked with people who believe that remodeling their kitchen or adding a bedroom or a rentable space will give them the home that they've always imagined, even to the point of mending an ailing marriage. I had one client confess to me that she wanted to remodel so that she and her husband had something in common, something they could work on together. But these projects are inherently disruptive and stressful, especially if you have no history of compromising. It doesn't work. Gratitude for what you have comes first. Without it, you could live in Cinderella's mansion in the happiest place on earth, and it would seem empty, lifeless, and fearful. Just somewhere to store your stuff. I do not believe that we as a community can give someone a home. We can provide shelter. That's doable, more than doable, it's happening, as is being demonstrated by Dignity Moves and other organizations around the country. But the shelter has to come with dignity. And that is the second ingredient for creating a home. Several years ago in LA, the city contracted with the owner of the Mayfair Hotel in, in Westwood to rent out rooms to unhoused people in the area. It was not sustainable, either financially or socially. It was not, uh, it, there was security checks at the door. Rooms were routinely searched for drugs and alcohol. 
There was little or no maintenance and no locks on the doors, and predictably, people went back on the street. It closed down after three years. People knew they were being warehoused. No respect, no dignity. The offer of shelter did not come with a heart. LA is trying again. Mayor Bass is negotiating to buy that hotel, renovate all of its 278 rooms, and include communal spaces for dining and kitchen, abuse counseling, mental health services, as well as a computer lab and job training. This works. These same amenities are present on a smaller scale at the Dignity Moves Village, to which they have added a community garden. And the most requested item, locks for the doors. Dignity and respect are intangible but powerful tools to create the mindset of home. Where do you learn and nurture gratitude and the value of addressing people with dignity? Here, you can learn that here. It is not a coincidence that this room is called a sanctuary, a holy place, a safe space to practice our UU values to use in the greater world out there. This is a house of worship. What will it take to make it your home? Our spiritual home. Gratitude, treating each other with dignity and respect, service, and a commitment to fellowship. Intangibles, but immensely powerful and contagious. This is my home. And I am eternally grateful that I have it. I'd like to share with you a reading that is commonly attributed to Lao Tzu, but is probably written by somebody else. But nonetheless, many of you might be familiar with it. If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. Good morning, you, you family. Happy Mother's Day. My name is Amber. I've been a member of this community for about four years. My daughter, Olivia, who you saw up here, and I have been welcomed by all of you with open hearts, warm smiles, and warmer hugs. A couple years of exception there somewhere. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm here to share with you a bit about our home and my story and some challenging parts as a renter in Santa Barbara. The little 1920s craftsman bungalow where we live about a block that way through Alice Keck's garden is a home that I cherish. I've rented there since 2018, just me and half of the time Olivia. I've been fortunate that my career in technology let me afford a place on my own. After separating from my husband for her safety, I've been unwilling to make certain compromises, like sharing housing with strangers. For a few years after move-in, we lived there in relative peace. We planted a garden, befriended our neighbors, and moved in and out of states of overwhelm with typical things like laundry and dishes and toys. Neighbors in the complex welcomed us with a mix of caution and cheer. They'd lived there 14, 20, 30, 40 years in that complex, and some weren't sure whether they liked the idea of living with a kid. 
but we were happy to be there. A short walk from downtown and a block away from a beautiful community garden, a duck pond, and kids world. For me, it was a dream manifested. More recently, and over the past year in particular, living there has come with a number of challenges and a healthy amount of uncertainty. In 2021, a long and disruptive sales process was completed and the property was handed over to a new owner. The new owner, a well-known investor in the Tri-Counties, was often seen suddenly on the property with surveyors, planners, builders. He mentioned that he intended to raise rents by 100%. After a few months, he handed out eviction notices to half the units. He used the necessary renovations clause of the 2019 ordinance as the reason. He didn't do it correctly, and he didn't pay relocation assistance, which is against the law in Santa Barbara. But as is so often the case, the first to receive those notices didn't know their rights, and they conceded to the demand, and they moved. One of these was a neighbor who'd grown very dear to me. Her name was Tony. She'd lived there over 20 years. She was only in her mid 60s, but she was frail. She was battling two degenerative diseases and her housing assistance wasn't able to immediately rehouse her. This landlord was notorious and she feared him, so she left. After spending what little savings she had on a very short hotel stay and having nowhere to go, she packed her few belongings she hadn't donated into two suitcases and she checked herself into Cottage Hospital requesting a psych evaluation. She went through various trials over the next couple months. She was eventually able to secure housing, but ultimately her sweet life ended four months after her eviction letter. You may already know that the rental market has really gone crazy over the last few years. Santa Barbara already had very, very low inventory of long-term rental properties available. It consistently, consistently hovers at around or below 1%. One could speculate it's made worse by the over-enrollment housing crisis at UCSB re recently, by re rental units coming off the market to be made into permanent short-term vacation rentals, think Airbnb, Verbo, Marriott, homes and villas, and by the influx of remote workers from other parts of the US as a result of COVID forcing companies to be more flexible. If you do a search on a trusted rental listing site for a freestanding two bedroom like mine, you'll likely find the range of the few you can find land somewhere between $3,600 and $5,000 a month. Most property managers would advise you that you could reasonably expect to receive somewhere around $4,200 a month for a place like mine. Now, Santa Barbara has a rent increase limit for homes older than 15 years. Annually, the law in SB is that a one year lease must be offered and that rent cannot increase year over year more than 5% plus cost of living to a max of 10% a year. So this is meant to protect the renters from a volatile rental market and allow for stability in housing, a fundamental need for people. So of course, in a situation like mine where a landlord would wish to take advantage of the market rate to make a 112% increase immediately, rather than increase at 10% at a time year over year, they have to find a way to get me out. Following the first swath of long-term tenants evicted from our property, there was a wave of lightly or non-permitted renovations and then an influx of new tenants. Then came the second wave and my first 60-day notice. Luckily, at that same time, some of my neighbors found a group called the Santa Barbara Tenants Union. It's through the work of those volunteers that I learned so much about housing law and about my rights as a tenant. SBTU believes fundamentally that all people have the right to safe, affordable, and stable housing. This is, believe it or not, a revolutionary idea. The right to housing is not guaranteed. However, the right to own and defend property is. That right to own and profit from property goes back to a decision by the Supreme Court made in 1857 called the Dred Scott decision, protecting the right of a slave owner to retain their property after Dred Scott had escaped slavery into free territories. As a paying tenant in good standing who has never been offered a lease per the law by this new landlord, I have been fighting for my right to remain in my home. A year ago, his first round of notices to our second wave of tenants uh, brought about, because we were educated about our rights, brought about a case by the city attorney's office with 18 misdemeanor criminal charges because that's how illegal these notices and his actions were. He withdrew those notices. 
He since tried again and again, each time with more commitment and more effort toward the goal. This latest round has me as the first one headed to face him in court. I am proud and grateful that I've learned my rights, but I have to admit that I'm also scared. I don't know what's next. I'm taking it a day at a time. I've also kept fighting. I've spoken out at city council and so has Olivia. Along with SBTU, I've organized in support of the tenants who are being mass evicted in Isla Vista. We've seen movement toward greater protection decisions by both the city and the county board. I've traveled with a group called Cause to Lobby in Sacramento for greater tenant protection statewide. Two weeks ago, I shared my story with the governor's office. I invite you to get involved. If you care to support the tenants of Isla Vista and other unincorporated parts of Santa Barbara, please join us this Tuesday morning to speak out at the Board of Supervisors meeting and show your support. We're asking for tenants who are rent evicted to have a mandatory offer by housing providers to return to their homes following their necessary renovations. You can find out more about Santa Barbara Tenants Union at svtu.org. I welcome your curiosity, your support, and your participation. Thank you. Every week at the Unitarian Society, we contribute to a project or program that lives our values in the world. And this month, our outreach offering partner is the Audubon Society, helping us nurture the wonder of nature in our community. Please read with me the affirmation of gratitude and giving that is on your screen or in your order of service. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. Let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. And let us be grateful, even for our needs, so that we may learn from the generosity of others. Traveling at night, the headlights were bright, and we've been up many an hour. And all through my brain came the refrain of home and its warming fires. And home sings me of sweet. My life, there has its own wings to fly over the mountains, though I'm standing still. The people I've seen, they come in between. The cities of tiring life The trains come and go But inside you know The struggle will soon be a fight And home sings me of sweet things My life
Traveling at night, the headlights were bright. But soon the sun came through the trees. Around the next bend, the flowers will send the sweet scent of home on the breeze. And home. Thank you, and thank you, Amber, for your courageous storytelling, and Peter for your gathered wisdom, and thank you to all for listening to these stories this morning. So, house and home. How many of you have ever played the game Monopoly? I mean... Is there anyone, I should maybe ask, is there anyone who hasn't played the game Monopoly? You've got one or two maybe folks, right? If you've played the game of Monopoly, I want you to think back, or maybe even just observed other people while they've played it, I want you to think back on the experience. How did the game make you feel? Did you enjoy it? Or did you quit in frustration halfway through? Did you ruthlessly crush your opponents? Or did you feel kind of guilty when someone landed on your boardwalk space after you had built a couple hotels and they were crushed by the rent? After all, the game only ends when one player has acquired all the properties and driven every other player to bankruptcy. That's winning. There's a great documentary about the origins of this game, so some of you may be familiar with this story, but it's worth telling. It started out, Monopoly started out as a game not to glorify greed, but rather as a teaching tool to point out the problems with land-based wealth. It was originally called the Landlord's Game, and it was created in 1903 by Lizzie Maggie, an inventor, a game designer, and a feminist activist at the time. And the original game, as Lizzie invented it, had two sets of rules. One which was anti-monopolist, where when wealth was created, everyone in the game benefited. And another set of rules, which was the monopoly rule set, where there was one winner who came out on top by building a monopoly and crushing their opponents. This game was supposed to demonstrate the problem with the system of monopolies in the United States. So do you remember that feeling of unfairness when you played the game? That perhaps the deck was stacked against you and that once you started losing, there was absolutely no way to climb out of that hole? Do you remember the fights and the tears this would create amongst siblings and friends? It was designed to make you feel that way. Lizzie Maggie hoped that by sparking that feeling of unfairness that even a child could recognize, it would inspire these children to grow up critical of the system and choose to play by different rules. The alternate rule set, where a property tax distributed wealth more evenly. 
However, despite the fact that Maggie had patented the game in 1904, and it had gained this kind of underground popularity on college campuses and around progressive circles, in 1934, a man named Charles Darrow claimed to have invented the game and sold the rights to Parker Brothers, but only using one set of rules, the Monopoly rules. Parker Brothers published the game, and it went on to be one of the most popular board games ever created, played all over the world. And so instead of being this teaching tool about the problem of greed, Monopoly turned into what it was trying to overcome and became this symbol of capitalist wealth. So fast forward now to 2023, the end of this past March, and there was an article in the local news about Mr. Monopoly playing a visit to Santa Barbara. Did any of you see that article? Most importantly, that picture, right? The photo of the iconic Mr. Monopoly board game mascot with his black top hat and his suit and his monocle and his white mustache, posing in front of City Hall with the mayor, publicizing this new version of Monopoly that will feature Santa Barbara landmarks. A few decades ago, there was an unauthorized version called Santa Barbaraopoly that you could buy, but that was not the official game, which is now owned by Hasbro. Hasbro has hundreds of versions of Monopoly floating around, and now it is Santa Barbara's turn. Mr. Monopoly, though, is not the original name for the mascot. He was first known as Rich Uncle Pennybags. So in March, starting at City Hall, rich Uncle Pennybags took a tour around Santa Barbara and was photographed with all of these different places that might show up on the Santa Barbara Monopoly board. It was not great timing. Because that very same week that rich Uncle Pennybags toured the city, it was announced that a real estate investment company had just bought up three large apartment buildings in Isla Vista and was beginning a mass eviction of hundreds and hundreds of people all at once. A real-life monopoly situation was playing out, and it was not just a game. Core Spaces is the real estate investment company that owns 46 properties in 29 college towns across the country. Their business model is to buy up properties near universities and turn them into luxury student housing. It's this storyline plucked directly from the Monopoly board, right, where your goal is to buy up all of the uh, adjacent properties so that you can then raise the rents. And there are a lot of places you can go for more information on this particular issue. It's being followed closely in the media, and the local tenants union has been doing some great community organizing, working not just with the people from the Isla Vista properties, but all the renters here in town so that they know their rights and can advocate effectively for them. And I'm sure that all of you here have not been living under a rock. You know that there is a rental housing crisis here in Santa Barbara. And while housing has always been difficult, the most recent statistics are shocking, even for the most jaded among us. I heard some of you gasping at some of what Amber shared. And the City of Santa Barbara's rental survey report for 2022 says that in order to afford the median rent for a two-bedroom apartment, not a house, an apartment, a family must have an income of about $140,000 for a two-bedroom apartment here in Santa Barbara. Meanwhile, if you're wondering what the median income for a family of three in Santa Barbara who might want to rent that two-bedroom apartment is, that median income is $90,000. So you can see the gap. Or to put it in practical terms, a family of two school teachers raising one kid is nowhere near being able to afford an apartment under these conditions. Thankfully, there is some movement. The county is making some progress on protections for renters because of the pressure created by these mass evictions and the organizing work that folks like Amber have been involved with, but we still have a long way to go before the game stops feeling so rigged in favor of landlords. From a bigger perspective, even children playing a simple game understand 
that there is a moral and ethical imperative to make sure that the rules are fair. That the winner can't just keep on winning all the time while everyone else slides further and further into ruin. Even kids understand the fundamental unfairness of losing everything because of an unlucky roll of the dice. And that the game is no longer fun when a single rent payment can bankrupt you. It's time to stop playing that game and switch to a different set of rules. The adult world of housing regulations and building codes and civic infrastructure is a lot more complicated than the Monopoly game, but the basic idea still holds that fairness matters. That no one should be at such a disadvantage that it becomes impossible to survive. And likewise, no one should simply be able to accrue profit on top of profit with no concern for the impact that it has on the other people in their community. But why are we talking about this now on Sunday morning? Housing policy is a pretty complicated and wonkish topic for a sermon. It's hard to get past all of those statistics and make it into something compelling. And there's lots of places you can get great information about the housing situation and current public policies. I'm not here to summarize all of that for you. Our work here is a little different. Our spiritual work, our religious work, is not just to understand the situation or advocate for specific policies, but to link the decisions we make in our civic life with the bigger vision of what kind of community we want to live in. To craft policies that serve us better, to help envision that different set of rules. In order to do that work, we need a shared moral understanding of why the issue of how we treat our neighbors, how we create communities where people have both physical shelter and personal dignity, how we navigate the needs of others as they relate to the needs of ourselves. These are not just civic concerns, they are religious concerns. Religion being one of the places where we figure out those moral and ethical responsibilities we have to each other. And it turns out that when I went digging, religion has a lot to say about this issue. It's been a spiritual concern, it turns out, for thousands of years. In the Christian tradition, Jesus spends a lot of time talking about the obligations we have to our neighbors. And the texts of the Christian Bible clearly articulate a vision of a world where the poor and disenfranchised are lifted up. One of the most familiar examples that many of you might know, whether you come out of the Christian tradition or not, is from the book of Galatians, where it says, For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become servants of one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You've heard that phrase before, right? But it's not just in the Christian scriptures, this commandment to love your neighbor, to give aid and support to those in need. In every major religious tradition, you'll find texts or stories that articulate our obligations to one another. In the Islamic tradition, there is a surah in the Quran which reads, Do good to your parents, to near of kin, to orphans and to the needy, and to the neighbor who is of kin, and to the neighbor who is a stranger, and to the companion by your side, and to the wayfarer, and to those whom your right hand possesses. Allah does not love the arrogant and the boastful. In Leviticus, in the Hebrew Bible, it says, if your brother becomes impoverished and his means falter in your proximity, you shall strengthen him, stranger or resident, so that he can live with you. In the Mahabharata, in the text from the Hindu tradition, it says, This is the sum of duty. Do not unto others which would cause pain unto you. And the Buddhist sutras say, For a state that is not pleasant or delightful to me must also be to him. And a state that is not pleasing or delightful to me, how could I inflict that upon another? 
So in all of this reading, I found a rare point of agreement amongst many, many diverse traditions, but I have yet to read a sacred text that says, get as rich as possible by accumulating land and resources, even at the expense of your neighbors, and protect for yourself every right of comfort and luxury, for truly it is your own needs who come first and the lives of others are of no concern to you. I haven't found that text in any of the wisdom traditions of the world. Instead, the accumulated wisdom of thousands of years of spiritual reflection and discernment tells us clearly we have an obligation to each other to give aid and support to our neighbors so that they may live with the same dignity and peace that we would wish for for ourselves. But if this is such a widespread understanding, why has our current system gotten so out of alignment with this value? Civic life, like religious life, is not a static thing. The rules and regulations that govern our public life, just like the rules and regulations that govern our religious and spiritual lives, are always in motion. And Unitarian Universalism is a faith that embraces this motion, that doesn't seek to create one final and perfect document of eternal truth, but rather a living and evolving understanding. Municipal codes are like that too. There is not one set of practices that will work forever, but they must constantly be re-examined and rewritten to address the needs of the moment. What worked a hundred years ago, or even twenty years ago, may no longer be what we need today. Living in community in this constant pull and push requires practice, just like a spiritual practice. You don't meditate once and say, there, I'm done with it, I never have to do that again. Just like you don't vote once and say, there, my civic duty accomplished for the rest of my life. Human beings are both wonderful and awful to each other from time to time, and the laws we create reflect that tension. The rules we are governed by can swing toward fairness and justice, but they can also be pushed toward selfishness and greed. The good news is that we have the power to make that choice. We have more than one set of rules that we can choose from. We can choose to bend the world toward beloved community where prosperity is shared or winner takes all. Our choice. Our role as a religious and spiritual community is to keep holding up the ethical commitments that we make to each other, our sense of neighborliness and compassion, and keep reminding people that our lives are interconnected. There are homeowners and renters, landlords and tenants right here in this space together. But it's not just up to the renters to fix this mess. This work belongs to each and every one of us. So together, we have to unrig the game. We have to rewrite the rules to serve the needs of this moment. But luckily, people have handed us instruction manuals who've played this game for thousands of years. We don't have to imagine these new rules from scratch. But we can look forward and discover better ways to build the beloved community. And if we can paint that picture clearly enough for people to explain to them the joy that can be found in a place where everyone can thrive, then maybe even rich Uncle Pennybags will agree to turn Park Place into a co-op someday. We can dream, right? May it be so, blessed be, and amen. Let us sing together again. Please rise in body and spirit and let us sing together number 134, Our World is One World. The words are on the screen or in the gray hymnal. Is one affects us all. The seas that.
that wash us round about the clouds that cover us, the rains that fall. The world is one world, the thoughts we think affect us all. So stay right where you are if you want to just put your hands over your heart or if you want to hold hands with the person next to you if the person next to you wants to hold hands with you or you can hold your hands open however it is that you get connected to that sense of larger life that moves through us and as we extinguish our chalice, uh, chalice and go forth into this beautiful and heartbreaking world may the light of love shine upon you out from within you be gracious unto you and bring you peace for this is the day we are given let us rejoice and be glad in it and let us call out a blessing mm -hmm.